Okay, good afternoon. I um, hope you all enjoyed lunch. And if you didn't get lunch, go get some lunch because they're going to throw that food away. Um, that's kind of what the health department says has to happen. So take seconds and thirds for a friend. So we are now with our other talented group, Latinx Mental Health. And their entire year has been really focused on thinking about the really the paucity of resources, the lack of resources that are available or not available to non-English speakers, even as I think um, people in general, and particularly for people of color, finding practitioners that look like us is really quite difficult. We've done a lot of work with the Dream Center because it really serves so many in our community, but especially the Latinx community. So today we will hear from Arden and Lee about their work together over the past year. At the back of the room, you will find some really nice cards that they designed as resources for you to put in your wallet with phone numbers for um, uh, like NAMI and the National Suicide Prevention Line and so on. And you will also find some of their brochures. So without further ado, um, just welcome Ashley and Arden. Hi, everyone. I'm Arden. Hi, everyone. I'm Ashley. Um, we decided to do our civic project on Latinx mental health and be advocates for something that has such taboo and stigma surrounding it to make it seem not as bad and that it's OK to have these feelings or these thoughts. And it's especially OK to ask for help. Can we do the, do we? Can we? Who has Who has We're going to start off by introducing who we are more extensively. Uh, we are Arden and Ashley, and we want to bring resources to light about mental health in the Latinx community. We've both been through our fair share of mental health issues and want to help others in need. Okay. My name is Ashley. You guys already know. Um, I came from the early college, and I am going next year to Elon. <laughs> I'm Arden, I graduated from Williams. I'm a first generation college and I'm the first in my family to graduate high school as well. What is mental health? The textbook definition of mental health is a person's condition with regard to their psychological and emotional well-being. However, mental health doesn't just affect people's psychology but also sometimes their physical being. Mental health is not something that is just in your head, it also can affect how you perceive yourself, how others perceive you, and especially your motivation and dedication to do things that you may have enjoyed in the past. These are some well-known mental illnesses that you may know. First one is anxiety. Anxiety can be defined as a feeling of worry, unease, or nervousness. The second one is bipolar disorder, which basically means having both manic or depressive episodes or only manic ones only. Another one is depression, which is persistent sadness and a lack of interest or pleasure in doing previously rewarding or enjoyable activities. Lastly, we have suicide, the act or instance of taking one's own life voluntarily and intentionally. How can you help someone? Listen to them. Understand what they're feeling is what they are feeling, and it doesn't just pertain to you. Um, give them support. Show them that you're there for them and that you always want the best for them and understanding. Um, don't judge them just because what they may be feeling isn't what you may be feeling doesn't give you the right to be like, oh, you know, you're not feeling this, it's not real, or something along those lines. Professional help. Offer to get in touch with someone or let them know that there is professional help available for something that they may be going through. What are some predisposing factors? For those who don't know, predisposing factors are not ex necessarily what causes mental illness, but what can accumulate to mental illness. First up, we have genetics, which is the mental health conditions that typically run in families. We have childhood trauma, which is something traumatic that happened in childhood, which could be still affecting them in present day. 
Unhealthy habits, which is drugs and alcohol, are also linked to having negative effects in the long run. Environmental, if someone is in a very toxic environment, it can lead to depression, low self-esteem, and high stress levels. Negative thoughts, low self-esteem can lead to negative thoughts, which usually lead to depressive thoughts or feelings. Lastly, stress. Stress can easily have irritability, insomnia, even a feeling of loss of control. Why is mental health awareness important? M mental health awareness is important because it reduces the stigma associated with certain mental illnesses. It creates a time and space to start a conversation about something people may not normally want to talk about. It can encourage those who are suffering from these illnesses to seek help. It educates people about available resources that they may not know that they have. It helps people recognize any warning signs that you or your loved one may be going through. It also helps people realize how mental illnesses may be impacting their lives. And it also provides an opportunity to fundraise for research, treatment options, and create bigger networks in the mental health field. Overall, mental health awareness leads to a promising future for mental health and everything that mental health involves. Anxiety in the Latinx community. What contributes to anxiety rates in the Latinx community? Some examples may be cultural factors, nativity status, um, for you guys don't know who that is, is basically whether you were born here or if you were born in another country. Age of immigration, which basically what age you may have immigrated from, perceived discrimination and socioeconomic challenges, and lastly, difficulties with language proficiency. Here are some of the graphs that we have. As you can see, it shows the anxiety, depression, and stress visit rate by race and ethnicity. Um, and also from 2014 to 2016, um, an inpatient visit rate as well for anxiety, depression, and stress. Another one is bipolar disorder in the Latinx community. What contributes to the bipolar disorder rates in the Latinx community? An example could be most Latinx community people are less likely to receive medication for their emotional problems. Medications such as mood stabilizers or antipsychotics. They're also less likely to see professionals for manic episodes and less likely to attend psychotherapy. They're also less, more likely to be uninsured and more likely to seek help from a primary care doctor before even considering a mental health specialist. Because for many of these people, they consider all these thoughts as being something physical, not something mainly mental. Um, different populations affected by the bipolar disorder, around 2.8% of the U.S. population has bipolar disorder. Nearly 83% have severe cases of this condition. Average age of onset is about 25, and people who receive a diagnosis in childhood or adolescence are more likely to exp experience severe negative long-term outcomes. Bipolar disorder affects men and women equally. Women with bipolar disorder are more likely to experience rapid cycling, mixed mood episodes, PTSD, or eating disorders. Bipolar disorder affects different races and ethnicity at similar rates, but black and Hispanic, non Hispanic Americans versus non-Hispanic whites are more likely to receive a misdiagnosis, as well as are less likely to receive adequate treatment, follow-up, or mood-stabilizing medications. Depression in the Latinx community. What contributes to depression rates in the Latinx community? As we can see with many of the other illnesses, once again, it's the low use of medication, such as antidepressants and anti-anxiety med, um, and then families, which basically that thought of like, oh, my family doesn't approve of this, so I shouldn't go seek out help. Religion's another one, stigma, cultural identity and differences, and basically, lastly, it's barriers to the mental health care. Um, this shows the share of people ages 18 and older experiencing any mental illness in the previous years who have received mental health services. As you can see, Hispanic or Latinx is so much lower than non-Hispanic white people because Latinx people typically when they go to the doctor, only focus on the physical aspects of something and not the mental aspects that they may be feeling as well. Lastly, suicide in the Latinx community. What contributes to suicide rates in the Latinx community? Examples could be socioeconomic stressors, religion, stigma, cultural values, accumulation, and discrimination. Suicide rates per 100,000. Um, men are around 3.9% 3.9 times more likely to commit suicide than women. June is National Men's Health Mental Health Awareness Month as well. Um, 
white non-Hispanics and non-Hispanics are up there, or white Hispanics, black non-Hispanics. Overall, I would suggest, like, <laughs> sorry, um, just there's a lot of suicide going on that really could be solved if we really re reduce the stigma or the taboo surrounding the subject of mental health. North Carolina's suicide rate is 13.2 per 100,000 people. The U.S.'s suicide rate is 14.3 per, per 100,000. North Carolina is almost at the national level for suicide, and I think that's something to be concerned about. What does resource availability look like in the Latinx community? Access. Along with the issue of insurance, a shocking 56.8% of Latinx slash Hispanic young adults, along with 396 of adults with serious mental illness, do not receive any treatment for it. Over here we can see a graph basically showing the amount of uninsured Hispanic compared to white, Asian, other. And we can see that they have a really huge number compared to the other numbers. How does LMHA aim to help? Latinx mental health advocates aims to provide access to resources for those in need, can be in the form of websites, numbers to calls, books, or even podcasts, Re reduce the stigma surrounding mental health. It's not something you should be shunned for, neither is it something you should be embarrassed about. Educate others about the importance of mental health awareness and allows for a better support system in the Latinx community. Here are some need to know facts. June is Men's Mental Health Awareness Month. Men are 3.9 more times likely to compare to women. In 2021, suicide rates were men. An estimated 50% of the Latinx people have mental illness. That's around 8.9 million people. July is BIPOC Mental Health Month, and Latinx high school students are less likely to receive any mental health services. And lastly, stress could be balancing two different cultures, defining the traditional family roles, and even miscommunications between a parent and child. So startling facts. Um, an estimated 18.3% of the population of the U.S. is Latinx or Hispanic, with over 16% of them reported having a mental illness. That's over 10 million people, or to better understand, that's above the population of New York City. Latinx parents born outside of the U.S. are less likely to are less likely to experience a mental health issue compared to those born inside of the U.S. Suicide thoughts, plans, attempts have risen to 8.6 in Latinx youth aged adults aged 18 to 25 compared to 7% in 2018. Binge drinking, smoking, illicit drug use, and prescription pain relief misuse are more frequent in Latinx adults with a mental health issue. Bilingual patients are oft often evaluated differently when evaluated in Spanish versus English. Also, Latinx Hispanic individuals are often under, under treated compared to their white counterparts. Mental health issues can be hard to diagnose, as Latinx patients will often focus on the physical aspects compared to the psychological ones during a doctor's visit. Remember, it's, it's okay, okay to, to ask, ask for help. help. And here's our contact. And we have an Instagram, if you guys want to go ahead and follow it. We do have an Instagram. <laughs> Are there any questions? I don't know. <laughs> Did you say non-English? Yeah. yeah. Do you have a business card? I, on the business card I have in the back, there are a few numbers you can write. You can text to in Spanish and call to in Spanish. We really want to incorporate not just an English aspect, but also a Spanish aspect, just because we are dealing with the Latinx community. But right now, I wouldn't say there's a lot of big Latinx like services you can find here in, the, in America. There's mostly more like focused on English. Um, a lot of patients refuse to go to a psychological treatment center because of how many, how less of like Spanish speaking people there are because I, I'd assume they just don't feel comfortable speaking about it in English and want to speak about it in their native language.
Oh, you can introduce us. Sorry. Introduce. It's pretty. I'm just seeing it for the first time like you are. Um, so this is Infinity Learning. And from their name, you can understand that when they came up with this idea, first they wanted to mentor everybody. And I said, great, but let's try to narrow. And we decided to go with girls. So a lot of the things you see at the back are about female empowerment as well. Then because they are women of color, we thought about some of the culturally specific ways that and needs of BIPOC girls in particular. So today, Danielle, Daniela, Taylor, and Jaquila are going to share with you some of the activities and exercises and events that they attempted to do with their cohort of girls, but also some of the challenges um, of getting everybody together at the same time, and some of the strategies that we talked about and used for working um, with people with busy live schedules and, and frankly, some issues as well. So hopefully in the Q&A, we can tease out a little bit more of that. So welcome, Infinity Learning. So the reason why we named the program Infinity Learning is because we feel like learning is infinite and learning is reciprocal, meaning not only was our girls like learning from us, but we were also learning from them. Hello, um, so my name is Taylor Wiley and I graduate this year from Williams High School and I will also be going to Clemson in the fall to major in animal sciences. Just a few things I'm involved in at school is student council. Um, I was also one of the captains on the dance team this past year and I've also been on the dance team for the past four years um, and I'm also in Key Club and do a lot of volunteering. Hello again. My name is Shakela, and I also graduated from Williams this year. Um, a couple of things that I do, I play basketball and do track and field. I'm also very into all the clubs, so like any type of club there is, even marching band, I'm in it. Um, I'm going to the University of Alabama in the fall to major in psychology, and I will take the pre-law route, so I'm a future attorney. Hello everybody, my name is Danielle Bunker. I'm a senior at Eastern Elements High School. I also do a variety of activities within my school. I'm the co-founder of the Black Student Union at my school. I've been on the volleyball team for four years. Um, I'm on the debate team. I was the vice president of the National Art Honor Society. And yeah, I just like to do a bunch of different variety of things. Anything that the school's doing, I pretty much like to participate in as well. I plan on attending a and State University in the fall to study political science with hopes of becoming an attorney. Um, hey, y'all. Um, my name is Daniela Munoz. I also graduated from Williams. Um, I'm in a lot of different clubs as well. I was in Halo Club, which is the Hispanic American Latino organization. Um, I was the captain of the tennis team at Williams. I was on the team for four years. Um, oh, I was also in the International Baccalaureate. I don't know if anybody knows what that is, but <laughs> it's hard work, y'all. And I'm going to Charlotte to hopefully go into the forensic psychology room. So at Infinity Learning, we are a group of mentors that are basically dedicated to teaching and mentoring high-risk, marginalized um, teens in our community, specifically eighth grade girls. 
Um, so we provided tools, resources, and things they needed to really be successful. I can say that mentoring is something that we definitely, like, we're all passionate about, and we all came together and decided this is what we want to do. And especially in our small town of, like, Alamance County, that's why we decided to do our mentorship program. So um, growing up in Alamance County, we have personally seen and experienced how Marginalized um, communities have sometimes been overlooked. Sometimes it's not that students don't want to learn or succeed. Sometimes it's that the resources may not be there. And so we realized this need, we saw it, and we came together and we were like, we're passionate about this and we want to do something to help. And so with this goal and vision in mind, we decided to create Infinity Learning, where learning is reciprocal. Um, and so we decided to build this mentorship program at Broadview Middle School. Um, a group of eight girls that we were going to mentor um, throughout our entire program. And, um, yeah. So here are just a few of the graphs and statistics we were able to find um, on the internet that just compares EOG scores based on your race, ethnicity, and also your financial status. So in this graph here, it shows the first graph is all of ABSS students. And then as you go further down, it gives different categories. Um, like I said, race, also your gender and your economic status. And it compares the um, average EOG scores in the green is 2019 and the red is 2021. So when we were originally starting this project, um, obviously it was like a year ago. So these, sorry, these data points were a little bit more accurate, but they still are valid um, and important when it comes to us finding our purpose and our purpose for this research and this project itself. Um, you can obviously see that the scores are obviously higher in what they consider to be acad academically gifted. But also, if you look a little closer to when it breaks down with male, female, and race between black, white, and Hispanics, after 2021 and post-COVID, everything started to go further down. Um, you can see there's almost double in differences, depending on which category you're taking a look at. So if you do the math or look at the like correlation between, yes, the pandemic had an effect on academics, but also economic, economic status, which also limited certain resources depending on who you were and what you were doing. So for example, tutoring, you may have more access to pay for tutoring um, pre-COVID and then post-COVID that may have not been an option or something that you know your family might have chosen not to be able to, to do an expense on, therefore it had an effect on your academic um, outcome. And so here is one more statistic that talks about graduation rates. So this one's a little bit more relevant to us considering we're in high school. Um, it breaks it down with ABSS, North Carolina, and also each high school in the district, again, comparing 2019 to 2021. And so most of these numbers are improvements, but if you look closely, Williams and Western High School both decrease by, by about 1% to 2%. And 1% to 2% may not seem like a large amount, but until you take into the account school population, environment, and also district effects, Williams had about um, 1,169 students. The graduation rate dropped by 2.3%, so that means 27 students did not make it past high school. And so when you look at these numbers and you think about our program, you should ask yourself, where are these students now and what is the school doing to help and just do that? And is it only also because of academics or is it also because something totally separate? Because a lot of times it's not that students necessarily don't come to school, but also it's about why they come to school and where they feel accepted and the communication and connection that they have with their teachers also. So if someone has a good connection with their teachers, they're more likely to come to school than deciding just to not come and deal with academic things on their own at home. Okay, so to conclude, we believe that this program will make a difference because more than the academic support the mentees got, they also got a long-lasting support system within us. Um, when we implement programs like Infinity Learning at younger ages, we have a better chance of improving statistics in ABSS um, student by student. So, so. Thank you. We appreciate your time and attention. And now I'll open the floor to any questions that y'all may have. So, 
So we had a couple of challenges. Um, one being that, so Taylor always said, if you can't, if they can't come to you, then you go to them. And we actually had to, we had to really stress that a lot because some of these girls, like they've never experienced anything close to a mentor before. So we had to go to their school and we had to come to them and we had to keep being consistent. Um, yeah, just to just, I guess, piggyback off of that. Yes, it was a struggle to get the girls to be able to come. So, like, for example, we would always have or try to plan activities that were based on something that would help them with a bigger um, situation or problem. And so with us having the saying of we're learning as reciprocal, we learn from them that if you're trying to help somebody or you want to aim to help a specific community, you have to go to that community and you cannot expect for that community to come to you if they want the help because a lot of times people don't, won't come to you as for the help and you just have to give it and hope that they receive it and they enjoy it and that they come back for more. Um, and so a lot of times our most, our most um, successful meetings happened when we would go to Broadview after school, just talk to them about their day, check up on like their grades and see if there's anything they need help with. And then also like one of our other most successful meetings was just when we picked the girls up and went to go grab lunch with them. Um, and we're like getting all the information and the tea that was going on in the middle school and it was like we had a little sisters just meetings. So I think those are the most um, beneficial most recently and I think it humbles us to be able to say this also but we most recently had an activity that we invited all eight girls to come to and probably about 15 minutes prior to the event only one of them were able to come and showed up and that was because we picked them up. And so we took what we had and she had the best that she could um, with her activity, but then today it helps us learn also that you have to go to the source and the root of your problem. I also wanna say something about that. Uh, I feel like another struggle that we had was the time management because we all have lives, we all have schoolwork, and we all have jobs, but then they also have their lives too. And a lot of them were in volleyball or they had soccer practice or they had any like any in any clubs that they were in. So it was really hard to try to find days that it will match up with everybody's schedule so we can all meet together. So I feel like that was another struggle that we had. That's a great question. So actually, um, I had two girls myself. Um, they're very sweet and kind girls. I believe that there was definitely a communication barrier because I myself as a person, um, when I'm meeting people for the first time, sometimes I can be a little bit more like shyer on the sire side. And they were definitely a little bit more like outgoing than sometimes what I'm used to. And so I think really the challenge of communication was just learning how to communicate and broaden like your horizons with people and just kind of get outside your bubble. Because when you communicate with people, you kind of have to, like Tay was saying, kind of like meet them like where they're at. And if they're communicating in a certain way, you don't want to just kind of stay in your mind. So you want to kind of help to communicate, to break the tension, the barriers there. So I feel like that was a challenge on boards. It's just learning how to really make an impact on these girls' lives as well as like communicate with them effectively. I think that's a, also a great question. I think something that I would tell the adults is really when you're like communicating, um, actually like across the board, I would say just like keep an open mind and kind of willing to, I guess, go outside of your comfort zone when like communicating. I think that's like the biggest thing that I've learned. So our plan is to stay connected with them because we feel like we've made such good bonds with them and we are kind of like their big sisters now. That was like one of our main goals was to not make it seem like we're their teachers or but more like their sisters and that we're family so they could be more comfortable with us because we feel like that's something that we've lacked um, coming up and that a lot of people lack and 
there was this one girl, I'm not gonna give any names, but we had one mentee who was in like, who was in trouble a lot and we couldn't really seem to reach her, but after a while if we kept, um, we kept connecting with her and we kept reaching out, she finally, you know, opened up to us and so no. Um, I'd say give them a chance, um, give them multiple chances. No one is perfect. So even if they do get into like any discipl disciplinary um, events, you should give them a chance and at least let them explain themselves. Some of these girls, they've, like I said, they've never even seen anything close to a mentor before. So they don't really know how to connect or communicate with them. I wanted to add on real quick that for this program, we um, got eight girls, so two for each of us, and we try to match us up, like match us up more so how alike we are, so we can have a better connection. Because it's great to have group things, but I feel like people don't really open up to you at a different at the different level that we wanted, unless it was more so of a small group. So we each have like two mentees that we're really close to and those bonds I feel like also help us um, become closer to them towards the future in the long run, so. We Could you repeat the question one more time? So the principal and mm -hmm. the school, what role do you think that the school administration or the principal will play in like the sustainability of this program? Because it sounds like once the girls leave school and go home, it's really hard to connect with them. So, so like, could it be supported during the day? Like, what role could the principal play in sustainability? So I believe that other schools, definitely Broadview, at least for our um, sense, should definitely keep something like this up. There's already are a lot of programs out here now um, that are mostly mainly for male athletes or male um, boys just to keep them out of trouble or in line or just stay involved ac academically and also in their community. But as far as Broadview, I think that they should be able to not only just make club, like I feel like they should create clubs and organizations within the school and not as like a whole school um, perspective because Broadview already has things around the school that make people try and feel inclusive um, culturally and also just like by themselves but if they did a smaller aspect and put an aim to certain groups like we will then they would be able to learn their students a little bit more and also give them more opportunities because I feel like the girls also were a little bit iffy about the program when they joined because like we came in the room and we were like hi guys hey girls and they were just like oh my god what have I gotten myself into but if you really understand and get to them at a personal level then the program would expand a whole lot more. I feel like the girls' schools had, they had more support from their school than we did. I feel like when being in high school, in all honesty, um, the principals or the teachers don't really know or really care if you leave school. So I know a lot of us, I, some of us didn't have um, classes at the end of the day, but I know some other one of us, um, we just kind of left. They didn't really know, so... <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so how do you think the school, any school, could support programs like these if they're not supporting their students that can actually do their homework? 
I say one way to start is by them actually attending events like these. Um, I'm not sure about you guys, but I know multiple principals were um, invited today and staff members. And I think once they see like the hard work that everyone has put in, maybe they understand more and they give us chances to leave and be more like accepting of what we're doing. Um, I can explain a little bit how that was done. So originally our head plan was for us to be able to go into Broadview um, for a week that we weren't in school and just see a couple of the classes and see if there was just like anybody who stood out to us. But then after um, explaining it and going over with like Dr. Lane and stuff and talking to Ms. Lancaster, the principal at Broadview, she recommended just eight girls alone that she thought would fit for the program. Um, and so those eight girls came and we met them in a meeting and then went from there. But we had originally planned to like pick them on our own. Yes, definitely their athletics. We have multiple athletes um, in the group, and it's like it's kind of sad that they have to go to like a whole nother different school or a whole nother different like building just to play their sports. So I think definitely funding not only for sports but for female sports at that. And to kind of piggyback off of what Jaquela was saying. Um, Really, with those girls, like she said, a lot of them are student athletes, and I just lost my place. I was going somewhere. I just lost it. <laughs> that sucks. I just had something I was going to say. I just lost it. Um, sorry. <laughs> are there any more questions while she collects her thoughts? <laughs> I just lost it. Um, so, Dr. Lane, if you don't mind... Um, we have an activity for you guys just because we feel like everyone should be able to have like a thought of what kind of mentor they they have like they want. We feel like everyone should have a mentor no matter your age, your race, your gender. Anyone everyone needs a, a mentor. So if you don't mind, Dr. Lynn, can we go back downstairs and we're gonna get you guys to create vision boards for your ideal mentor. Do you guys? They're not mandatory. Either. We'll just pass them out, and if you do, then you do this. <laughs> you know, but, but I do think we can have them back downstairs because that's where the folks are. That's where the folks are. Thank you, guys. Thank you.